lot of us are disenchanted when it comes to religion. After all, there's so much hypocrisy and abuse and scandal. Our, our front pages are full of failings of religious leaders. Is it any wonder that people are checking out of organized religion, even if they might still retain some interest in Jesus? You know, sometimes I think we forget that Jesus' harshest words were reserved for the religious elites of his day. In fact, Jesus coined the term we now use, hypocrite. Hypocrite. He came up with this word in applying it to religious disintegrity. Prior to Jesus, the term hypocrite simply meant actor. It was used of the actors in the Greek theater who would wear those masks. You've seen them in the, in the images, you know, the happy mask of comedy, the frowny mask of tragedy. They wore the masks literally in the theater. Jesus took that term hypocrite, actor, and applied it to religious leaders of his day, calling them out for their play acting of religion, their moralistic mask wearing that disguised who they really were. In fact, Jesus railed against danger in religion. He didn't pull his punches when it came to calling out religious leaders for their abuse of leadership. Jesus despised much of what we also disdain in organized religion. And here at the end of Luke chapter 11, wrapping around to chapter 12, we find Jesus going after dangerous religion. And he takes off the gloves, he holds nothing back. And in doing so, Jesus reveals to us just what it is that God desires most. It turns out that God is not interested in religion. After all, he's interested in a relationship with his children. And Jesus has come to show us this, to bring us back home, to create a way back home to what it's always been all about, a relationship with God himself. And so if you find yourself here today and you're disenchanted with religion, I want to invite you to hear the words of Jesus, what he has to say, because I think you'll find that Jesus is even more upset uh, with the dangers of religion than you are, and you'll find that Jesus' call, his response, his solution is far more compelling than anything you might imagine. So let's lean in and listen to Jesus. Grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11, thir verse 37, wrapping around to chapter 12, verse 12. Luke 37, all the way to 12, 12. You'll find today's reading in the Pew Bible. If you want to pull that out, you can join us on pages 870 and 871. 870 to 871. Again, Luke chapter 11, verse 37 is where we'll begin. This is all about dangerous religion, and Jesus is going to highlight three dangers in particular, the danger of hypocrisy, the danger of elitism, and the danger of coercion, okay? The danger of hypocrisy, elitism, and coercion. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray, and we'll dive in. Father, would you save us from the dangers of religion? when it goes bad, when it goes off the rails, the seeds of all of this lie in our hearts. We're all just a few steps away from getting in a big mess. And so Lord, help us to hear the warning of our Jesus today about the dangers of religion. We pray this in his matchless name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. All right, number one, the danger of hypocrisy. The danger of hypocrisy, 1137. When Luke, er, this is in Luke. <laughs> when Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? 
but give, alms, give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. And just pause for a moment. This kind of ex- escalates quickly, doesn't it? You know, why don't you come to dinner? You aren't washing, you fools. I mean, it's like, it's, it's quite a lot. What's going on here, right? Remember Luke, uh, how Luke begins here. He says, while Jesus was speaking. So this, this is interrupting the flow of something Jesus is already saying. It's what we looked at last time. They've been accusing Jesus of uh, casting out demons by the power of Satan. Uh, they've just skeptically demanded that Jesus prove himself beyond everything he's already done in terms of miracles. They want more. They've scorned him in disbelief, which prompts Jesus to respond and says, this generation is an evil generation. Strong words. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Just like he was in the belly of the whale three days, three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights before I rise from the dead. And Jesus warns them, you better let in the light before it leaves. Well, because while I'm with you, you have light. I am the light. You better let me in. And it's on the heels of all of these strong statements, these sober warnings, that this Pharisee now asks Jesus to dine. Now, the Pharisees thought of themselves very highly, didn't they? They, they, they figured if, if, if anyone was on God's good list, it was them, right? Surely Jesus didn't mean to include them when he said, you are a wicked and evil generation. Surely he didn't include them, those harsh words of warning. That must be for the populace, you know, the unwashed masses, the, the, the wicked people. We can all agree, the Pharisees, you and me, Jesus, that all those people have problems. The darkness in them is great, but we're good, right, Jesus? We're good, Pharisees, Jesus, we're on the same team. Tell you what, you, let's do dinner and we can sit around and talk more about how much those sinners have to shape up, okay? That's the scenario. And Jesus knows their hearts. He knows what's going on deep down, their self-righteousness. And so he stages a little object lesson here. And he decides, I'm not going to wash before dinner. Now, before you germaphobes start grossing out here, this washing wasn't for hygiene. This was a, a washing of ritual purity. The Pharisees had invented a ritual ceremonial washing to do to cleanse themselves from contact with the outside world, from contact with sinners. It wasn't required in the Old Testament. The Pharisees made this up. And they, if they had been out among the people, if they'd been with commoners, you know, with, with humanity, the sea of humanity, they might have accidentally touched a sinner, you know, a thief or a liar, or a prostitute, or a tax collector. And, and if they did, then they might have become tainted and defiled and befouled before God, they thought. And so through this unknowing association, they might have come in contact with sinfulness. And so they came up with this ritual washing to decontaminate themselves from contact with a sinful world. And that's the washing that Jesus doesn't do. And the Pharisee is shocked because after all, he knows Jesus eats with sinners and tax collectors, doesn't he? He's just been around sinful masses, but now he's with holy people, righteous people, Pharisees, teachers of the law, all of whom are meticulous about ritual cleansing, and Jesus skips the washing? Huh? He's like, Jesus, we know you've been rubbing shoulders with sinners. It's going to rub off on us. Ooh. You know? And Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. And so he calls out the, the Pharisees for their self-righteous hypocrisy. He goes, look, you're, you're obsessed with washing the outside of your dishes and cups. Like, but you neglect to wash the inside, which is where they need the cleaning the most. And of course, it's an analogy, isn't it? He's, he's not talking about hand-washing dishes. He, he's talking about you, you're, you're so obsessed about outside contact with sinners that sinners out there are going to somehow contaminate you while your own hearts are full of greed and wickedness. 
He's saying, look, your main sin problem lies within, not without. There's more greed and wickedness deep inside of you than anything you're going to get through secondhand contact. God made you a whole being inside and out. He doesn't just care about the outside cleanliness. He cares about the interior cleanliness cleanliness of your life. You're an integrated whole being and you need to be cleansed from the inside out. Offer your heart to the Lord as as alms, as a gift, as an offering to him and, and then your whole body will be clean as well. Holy, clean, devoted to the Lord because God wants all of you inside and out. You need more than just clean hands. You need a clean heart. You need a clean heart. And then like a prophet from the Old Testament tradition, Jesus now levels three woes at the Pharisees. Number one, verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done while not neglecting the others. So in the Bible, God commands a tithe, a tenth of all that we have to be given to the Lord's work. The Pharisees were so scrupulous to maintain this tithe that they decided to tithe out of their spice racks, right? So a tenth of every seed, they'd count them out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten, that's for the Lord. One, two, three. I mean, that's what they're doing. Every seed, every herb, every leaf, they would give it to the Lord, which was well beyond what the Lord required in the law, but they wanted to be on the safe side. And Jesus says, while you were busy counting out herbs in dogged legal compliance, you neglected the weightier matters of the law. You failed to do justice to give people their rightful due as image bearers of God. You've, you failed to love your neighbor as yourself, and you failed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength as he rightfully deserves. While you were counting out seeds, you missed the whole point. You followed the letter of the law, but you missed the spirit. And he's saying, look, friends, God wants All of you, whole, integrated, integrity, loving God with a genuine heart, loving others with true justice. That's what it's about. Second woe, verse 43, woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. He says, instead of loving God and loving others, you've twisted religion into a kind of self-promotion. You're in it for the status and the honor and the recognition and the, and the perks. You've made religion about you. Third woe, verse 44, woe to you. You're like unmarked graves and people walk over them without even knowing it. You're like an unmarked shallow grave with just a little bit of earth covering your rotting corpse, and people walk on over and have no idea and come in contact with a decaying body and become unclean. If you came into contact in Judaism with a dead body, you were unclean for a week. You couldn't go to temple to worship. And Jesus says, that's what you're doing to people. People are stumbling over your corpse and coming into contact with your dead bodies. And don't you see, he's taking this full circle. You're obsessed with washing the uncleanliness of other people off of your hands, and you're the ones that are full of death and uncleanness. You're the ones making everyone else unclean with your duplicity, your disintegrity, your hypocrisy. Because Jesus is showing us, friends, that God desires integrated lives. God desires integrated lives. Your whole heart, your whole being, your whole self. Our problem lies not with sinners out there, but with the sinner in here, in us. 
And Jesus is saying, it's time you got honest. Before God, it's time you got right. Because you need more than clean hands, you need a clean heart. God desires an integrated life. That's the danger of hypocrisy, you see. Now, let's turn. Let's turn to the danger of elitism. Elitism. Verse 45, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. (laughs) So at this dinner, you've got Pharisees, a bunch of Pharisees, and you've got a bunch of these lawyers. These These are Old Testament experts in the law of God, okay? They, the Torah, we would call them Bible scholars, professors of religion today. That's who's at the table. And this particular Bible scholar decides to put Jesus in his place. He says, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us too. I'm sure you didn't mean to. Surely, surely you didn't mean to step on the toes of such distinguished members of the religious intelligentsia, such as us. You didn't mean that. And Jesus says, I got some problems with you guys too. Three woes for you. Verse 46, number one, he said to him, woe to you lawyers also. For you load people up with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You pile up the obligations of the law upon people's backs to the breaking point, and you won't even lift a single finger to help them, to help lighten the load. Jesus is confronting them for all the extras they've added to the law of God. For example, God's law says, you shall keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, honor the Sabbath, keep it holy, ceasing from work on the seventh day, yes? And what... And it's, it's very clear, whatever your normal vacation or vocation is, whatever your normal vo- vocation is, farmer, carpenter, retailer, you're to take that day off and worship the Lord, right? It's a beautiful gift to, of humanizing rest and enriching wonder for our lives. It's a beautiful gift, the, the Sabbath law. And then the lawyers got a hold of it. And the lawyers got together and they came up with 39 classes of work, all of which were forbidden in every case, in all circumstances on the Sabbath, okay? So no carrying, burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, tearing, knotting, untying, shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, sifting, grinding, kneading, coming, spinning, dyeing, chain stitching, warping, weaving, unraveling, building, demolishing, trapping, shearing, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, smoothing, or marking. Now, if you're taking notes, That's both marking and writing, so double violation, all right? And don't go try to erase it because that's strike three, okay? Jesus says, look, you're you're experts in the law, and what you've done is you've taken the good law of God that was meant to bless people, and you've turned it into an insufferable burden that is crushing the life out of the very people God intended to bless and, and be kind to. You're not helping people toward obedience. You're crushing them with legalism. Second woe, verse 47, a long one. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. He says, look, your your forebearers, the religious leaders throughout the Old Testament, they killed so many of the prophets that God sent to them in, in, to reveal his wisdom. 
your fair forebears, the, the people who had the same titles and sat in the same seats of authority as you do, they killed the prophets and now you're building the mausoleums. You're trying, you're trying to honor the dead prophets. You're trying to virtue signal that you would never do what your forebearers did before you, that you're on the right side of things now, but the only prophet you want is a dead one. The only prophet you're gonna honor is a dead prophet. Because when a real live prophet stands before you and gives you a prophetic word and says, woe to your face, even now you're seething on the inside, scheming how you're gonna get rid of me. You're just like them. The religious leaders have always hated and killed the prophets of God. And you religious elites, you always resist God's prophetic wisdom and the blood of these prophets, they're all, it's all gonna be on your heads. This generation is gonna pay the highest price of all because the wisdom of God is standing before you, right here, it's me, and you're plotting against me. You analyze the scriptures, but you do not know the voice of the living God. Third woe, verse 52, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. You've, you've professionalized religion. You've made theology so complex and inaccessible that you alone can be the gatekeepers to the knowledge of God. You made yourself the gatekeeper and then you blocked the door. There are so many people that are dying to know the living God and you're in their way. With all your credentials and all your pretense and all your footnotes and elitism, you've taken the law of God and you've turned it into an academic exercise when all along it was meant to disclose God's heart and help his lost children come home in repentance and faith because God desires earnest pursuit. That's what Jesus is reminding us. God desires earnest pursuit, not stringent legalism, not virtue signaling, not haughty expertise, but humble, earnest, heartfelt pursuit of God. Listen, friends, God does not want to be diagrammed. He wants to be delighted in. God desires earnest pursuit. There's danger in hypocrisy, danger in elitism, and now finally the danger of coercion. Danger of coercion. Verse 53, as they went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. One of the marks of dangerous religion, when religion goes bad off the rails, is the way that religion gets weaponized as a power play to intimidate, pressure, and attempt to control people. That's what's happening here. The Pharisees and the lawyers decide that Jesus has become a problem, one that they're gonna have to deal with, and so they huddle up and scheme and they concoct this plan. Let's see if we, get, we can get him to buckle under pressure, to slip up and make a mistake and self-defeat himself. They're conspiring. They're waiting to pounce. Do you see what they're doing? They're leveraging their positions of power to put pressure on Jesus in an attempt to intimidate him and coerce him. It, it's mob tactics, isn't it? It's religious abuse. And Jesus sees it for what it is. Look at verse, or chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Be, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And whatever you've whispered in private rooms 
shall be proclaimed on the housetops. See, the Pharisees, with all their secret meetings and their private plottings, Jesus says, I don't want you to trust them. They're like bad leaven, rancid yeast, working its way through the dough, infecting everything around it. Their hypocrisy is rampant, but it, all, it will all be revealed in the end because God sees all and knows all and there's nothing that's hidden from his sight. Every secret will be laid bare. He says, your earnest, heartfelt loyalty to God is my disciples. That'll be seen for what it is in the end. And so will their duplicitous, conceited agenda. It will be exposed for all to see. But in the meantime, I want you to beware. Be wary. The religious leaders, they're coming after me, and they're going to come after you. I want you to be prepared. Verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after, they have, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you're of more value than many sparrows. The religious leaders, Jesus says, they're going to come after you. And they're going to turn up the pressure. They're going to try to intimidate you and control you. And they'll threaten everything, including your life. But I don't want you to fear them. All they can do is kill your body and give you a one-way ticket to glory. I'll tell you, Jesus says, I tell you who you should fear. I'll tell you who you should fear. Fear the one who has the authority to cast into hell. That authority lies with God alone and him only shall you fear. I want you to fear God. I want you to be loyal to him, no matter what these religious leaders try to do to coerce you, because your heavenly Father loves you. He cares for the birds, and he cares for you. He's numbered every hair on your head, and he knows you completely. He loves you utterly and will keep you dearly. So entrust yourself to him, And he will hold you fast, so hold fast to him. And I want you to hold fast to me, Jesus says, because when the religious leaders come after you and pressure you to renounce me and deny your faith in me, I want you to stand firm. Look at verse 8, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. He says, look, when the religious elites come and they turn up the heat on your life, when they use all their coercive intimidation tactics, I don't want you to buckle under the pressure. Acknowledge me before men, and I'll acknowledge you before the angels in the presence of God. And you won't be on your own in that day. The Holy Spirit will be your defense attorney, and he'll give you the words, the very words to say. Do you see the the whole triune God showing up here? The Father caring for those who fear Him. The Son acknowledging those who are faithful to Him. The Spirit advocating for those who are depending upon Him. Jesus says, look, when they bring you before the synagogues to try to excommunicate you, when they bring you before rulers so that they can throw you in jail, when they bring you before the authorities so they can put you to death and martyr you, know that the threefold witness of heaven will stand at your side. Jesus says, look, they can dismiss the Father's wisdom. They've been killing the prophets forever, and yet the Father still sent the Son to offer forgiveness to the world. They can insult the Son's authority 
They'll even crucify me on a cross, but I will pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But if they blaspheme against the Spirit, the third witness who has come, there's no going back. There's no hope of forgiveness left. Who else can come and offer them forgiveness? If they reject the Father and the Son and now the Spirit, there's not a fourth member of the Trinity to come rescue them. If these religious leaders choose to persist in their rejection of Father, Son, and Spirit, murdering the Father's prophets, crucifying the Son incarnate, martyring the apostles who are speaking the very words that the Holy Spirit is giving to them on trial, these religious leaders, are, they're, they're rejecting the threefold witness of heaven and they're going to go down swinging. And if they do this, there's no hope of forgiveness left for they've rejected the only forgiveness available in the universe. They've rejected the triune God who alone can save. This is why it's such a dangerous thing what they were doing back in chapter 11 in Luke when they dismissed Jesus and said he's just demon possessed, casting out demons by the power of Satan. Not only were they rejecting the father who sent his son as a gift and they were rejecting the son, disparaging his reputation, they were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, calling the Spirit's work demonic. They were rejecting the threefold witness of heaven. And Jesus is saying, it's one thing if you reject one witness. It's another thing if you reject two witnesses. But if you reject the third witness, Father, Son, and Spirit, there's no one left to come and offer you forgiveness. It's only judgment day. Do not reject, he says, the only forgiveness there is in the universe. Do not reject the triune God. And do you see what Jesus is calling his disciples, you and me too, in all of this? In the face of religious coercion, Jesus is calling us to what God wants, that God desires faithful obedience. God desires faithful obedience. Do not cower before men, but be courageous for the Lord. Do not falter under pressure, but be faithful to the end. Do not reject the witness of heaven, but be responsive to the light you've received. God desires faithful dependency. He's saying, hold fast to your triune God, for the Father, Son, and Spirit are holding fast to you. Hold fast to your triune God, for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are holding fast to you. Because friends, bottom line, God desires relationship, not religion. God desires relationship, not religion. Don't, don't you see, dangerous religion isn't anything new. It's not. it's not. It's not like we just discovered it, you know, just diagnosed it. It's been around for centuries. Hypocrisy, legalism, elitism, abuse of power, even religious violence, hmm? None of this is new. Jesus railed against this kind of twisted, toxic, traumatizing religion. It couldn't be further from the heart of God, friends. And don't you see, Jesus has come to recalibrate it all, to show us what God is actually about, what he's always been all about, that God desires relationship, not religion. And the good news that the Bible tells us is that no matter who we are or where we're from or what we've done, we are all loved by God and are wonderfully made in His image. The bad news is that we've all turned away from God. We've chosen our ways ahead of His and are separated from God, evidenced in all kinds of suffering that we experience in this world. But the very best news of all is that God has not left us in our mess 
that God has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and he's done everything to make us right with God when he died in our place and for our sake, to pay for our sins and rose again to make us right with God, to give us abundant life, not just in this life, but in the world to come. Which means, which means, friends, though we are far more sinful than we ever dared realize, in Jesus Christ, we're far more loved than we could ever dare hope. In Jesus, you and I, we could finally come home to the relationship with God we were always made for. It's okay. Listen, friends, it's okay to be disenchanted with religion. Jesus was. But please, 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 please don't make the mistake of confusing dangerous religion with a dynamic relationship with the God you were made for. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus came to give you. It's what he came to, to bring. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? Hold fast to Jesus. Do you bow your heads and pray with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we want to hold fast to Jesus. Father, forgive us for all the ways we twist and corrupt what you're about into self-serving, self-righteous religion. That game has been going on for centuries. It's still going on. And the seeds of it are in all of our hearts. Father, protect us from the dangers of religion. Protect me from the dangers of religion. Help us to cling to Jesus and the beauty of the gospel and the wonder of your loving pursuit that reached down from heaven in Jesus Christ and gave it all to bring us home. Father, Jesus is beautiful. We want to hold fast to him. We thank you that Jesus doesn't back down from any fight. And that's good news because he fights for us. And so we cling to him. We cling to you, Father. We hold fast to you, Jesus. We hold on to you, Holy Spirit. We pray that you would be our all in all as we cling to you. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.